Hello, everyone. Welcome to Mining Now. I'm your host, Jared Downey. Today on the show, we've got a, uh, a great company coming on, North Isle Copper and Gold. Uh, this is their part two, and they're joining us for the PDAC special episodes of Mining Now we're doing. We're going to have our first guest be Sam Lee. He's the CEO of North Isle. And then Robin, Robin Tolbert, he is going to focus on the exploration side, whereas Sam is going to focus on more of the higher level side. So yeah, enjoy the show. And Sam, welcome to the show. Good Thanks, to have you on. Good to have you on. Nice to meet you. Um, yeah, I, I always say I have these like really good friends for like uh, 30 minutes doing this show. <laughs> That's right, exactly. <laughs> um, but I, I, it's also like a free education for me. So uh, let's... We we had uh, we had Nick Van Dyke on yes before um, he he had a great uh, interview and, and really gave us sort of the a lot of the details about the area um, that you're trying to mine in and everything like that yes um, can we go from can you give us a quick summary of it for anybody who hasn't heard of North Isle and then we're going to get into some of the financing stuff pretty quick here. Sure. Um, so North Isle uh, has a copper and gold porphyry uh, in British Columbia, just on the north end of Vancouver Island. So this is just adjacent to the historical BHP Island copper mine. Uh, why this is of significance is because I think, as everyone knows, copper um, is becoming, and in, in my mind, has always been the critical metal um, for the future. So when we talk about decarbonization, electrification, uh, getting to our aspirational 1.5 degree mm -hmm. climate change goals, you will need to spend 1.2 trillion dollars uh, in critical metals in order to achieve these goals and of that 1.2 trillion dollars 750 billion dollars needs to come from copper there aren't that many copper projects in the world today that exist um, and so what we think is extremely important is that because we are in a very safe jurisdiction rule of law is strong obviously uh, decisions are driven by communities first nations and the government uh, and the fact that we are um, we have an established five billion pound copper equivalent uh, indicated resource base with an um, additional uh, two, two and a half uh, billion pounds copper equivalent inferred. Uh, this is a project that I believe is going to resonate uh, very strongly in the future. How did you uh, end up in the, this position? Uh, CEO? A very good question. So um, I'm a metallurgist by background, oh, okay. um, but I did spend uh, the last 20 years um, at CIBC. I ran uh, the Vancouver Global Mining Practice on the investment banking side. Mm. I spent my career in Toronto, uh, Australia, where I dealt with a lot of the cross-border um, activity, and then in Vancouver for the last 10 years. And I would say that over uh, the... 20 years, about uh, $100 billion of transactions through other M&A uh, and equity um, uh, were, was the focus. And of that $100 billion, the vast majority came for projects like this, larger copper, gold porphyries um, that are meaningful, that are material, um, and that have uh, considerable attraction to um, to the strategics. So uh, I guess maybe we need to actually jump back one a little bit further in time. Sure. Then. How did you get from... Being a metallurgist to banking. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> so I was I should have said I was a failed metallurgist. <laughs> it was during the dot com boom. Okay. Uh, so the late nineties, if you remember, this was post Briex. This was uh, right in the heart of the technology boom. Uh, they needed uh, the banks were just looking for anyone who can kind of add, divide, subtract, and mm. multiply. Uh, and so they did uh, um, you know target uh, lots of um, faculties, um, including engineering. So mm. it was uh, it. It was off of uh, really uh, um, being uh, being pushed versus being pulled. Oh, I see. <laughs> right. And then, did you did you like that world? Like, I, I, I and this is leading to the question of how does it transfer to what you're doing now and yeah. getting something like this properly sure. financed and, and everything like that. Well, I think the wonderful thing about being an investment banker for that period of time um, is that you get exposed to the greatest leaders of our industry, right? So my clients would have included, uh, you know, Gold Corp, Placer Dome, Tech, Freeport, Antofagasta, um, so some of the largest companies in the world. And uh, getting exposed to how uh, companies like that think about propositions and think about opportunities, I think, is extremely helpful. Um, I do think that part of the narrative today is different than uh, what it was during the last super cycle, 2001 mm. to 2011, was really driven by China growth, uh, double-digit GDP growth, which we clearly don't see today. Mm -hmm. um, but the, 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 the real strength in the narrative today is really electrification, decarbonization. So while China was urbanizing and um, 
creating the infrastructure, especially in their grid, to 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 absorb that urbanization. Um, we're seeing the rest of the world now having to right. do the same level of activity, but for different reasons through uh, decarbonization and electrification. So I think it's um it's a it's a bit of a different theme. I think that ESG has also been a theme that has become no longer a checkbox, but perhaps a criteria when assessing projects. Uh, and so all of that really allowed me to converge to this uh, particular opportunity, uh, which again is in a very low ESG environment. Canada is uh, second to none in the world as it relates to low e ESG risk. We in British Columbia, uh, which is Canada's largest copper producer today, mm -hmm. um, is extremely well endowed uh, in terms of the infrastructure and the access to professionals to advance these types of projects. So uh, I think we're in the right jurisdiction, the right commodity, and the right time. Let's talk about our heavy industry tour brought to you by Savannah Equipment, supplying mining equipment worldwide and Corporate Traveler Canada, helping companies travel the globe simpler, faster and easier. We are heading to events across North America, Africa and Australia and filming episodes on location. Email us at info at crownsman.com to be part of Crownsman's heavy industry world tour. SafeSite has developed a suite of innovative technologies focused on step change improvements that impacts vertical mining, shaft measurement, underground mapping and survey, mine rescue, and emergency response underground. SafeSite solutions introduce new possibilities in approach and efficiency while keeping every site safer. SafeSite solutions deliver valuable data that can quickly be turned into actionable decision data that allows effective and safe operation. Digital guide alignment will reduce shaft maintenance costs, underground mapping drone technology that removes shadows for 100% accurate reconciliation, and mine rescue drones that extend the reach and range of responders on surface and underground. Visit safesitexp.com for more info. Hexagon's technology and solutions enable stakeholders across the mining industry to make better decisions faster. Get smarter, integrated cloudware, sensor software solutions, and in-field apps that connect mines to boardrooms in real time. Hexagon offers safer, autonomous, more sustainable open pit and underground mining solutions spanning exploration and planning, safety, and operations. Visit hexagon.com forward slash mining or email info.min at hexagon.com today. Um, the conversations here at PDAC um, have. Were you here last year? Yes, I was. Um, are you seeing? Are you seeing a shift? Um, the demands there. It's, it's not really a discussion if there's a demand there. That's, right. that's sort of. But um, are you seeing? Are you seeing an aggressiveness right. formulating now right. for companies like yours? So I think that uh, over the last couple of months, there's been a multiple uh, conferences, institutional conferences, uh, starting off with the TD conference in January, the CIBC conference uh, right before that, and then of course the BMO conference has just finished now. And the uh, the strong uh, consensus is the electrification, the critical metals that mm -hmm. drive this is the wave of the future. It's something that um, we're seeing generalists become more engaged with. It. You know, they're they're starting from a very very, um, very early level of understanding our industry, mm. but what they do understand is this macroeconomic drop that is undeniable, that is happening today, that it's going to be a, a real problem in the next uh, seven years within this decade because there are just, as I mentioned, not enough projects out there to satisfy the level of demand. So among the institutional crowd, among the, um, uh, the, the corporates, uh, yes, this narrative is very well understood. Among the retail uh, side of it, which is also a big uh proponent of this conference. Um, I think they, the understanding is there, but the conviction is not. Uh, mm -hmm. Or perhaps there is a little bit of sheepishness given, understandably so, that we are in an environment where there's a confluence of these negative events that are exasperating into recessionary fears. So supply disruption, COVID lockdowns, obviously China just came out of COVID lockdowns, the war, all of this culminated into a very risk off attitude mm -hmm. over the last six months. But not less demand. Not less demand. There's a there's a different supply demand. Um, uh, uh, I think um, uh, reality that's happening right now. Mm -hmm. We're seeing, and this goes to almost the social license and the ESG and the the rule of law, low risk environments that I've been talking about before, uh, where you see these countries like you know Peru and uh, Panama and to some extent Chile becoming destabilized in mm -hmm. a way yeah. uh, around some of the major projects that are being developed. And a lot of that has to do is with, I think, the fact that they came uh, into the 
the scene very quickly. Like Canada used to be top three copper producer in the world back in the 70s. And you could see throughout the decades um, where, you know, these Latin American countries have really displaced Canada. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and a lot of that has to do with not only the fact that they have great geology, they, there's no doubt about that, but you could expedite these projects a lot faster. Uh, and that's very attractive, of course, for investors and corporates. Everyone wants faster projects. So what we have today now is we've seen disrupted social license because perhaps some of these uh, projects uh, were um, not consulted on as thoroughly as they should be. Mm -hmm. They didn't have the social license established. And, and, you know, that's a huge supply disruption in the market that we see today that is causing this really historically uh, the lowest levels of inventory we've seen for, for copper and, and other critical metals. Um, is uh, this... Where do you see North Isle fitting into, um, I guess, a, a macro scale of supplying the industry, supplying the world? Yep. Um, and that there's no ex exaggeration in that yes. because it's such a demand. But then also um, fitting into the uh, British Columbian environment. That's right. Um, how do you see those two things sort of transpiring? That's a great question because, uh, like, in the end, I believe just based on that um, fact that I that I uh, stated before, the 1.2 trillion, 750 billion, there's not enough copper projects in the world. I think this is an all hands on deck. Every project that has even a remote chance of being developed in a socially responsible mm -hmm. uh, manner, environmentally responsible manner, needs to come online soon. And they need to come online soon. Uh, the issue, though, is that um, a lot of these projects that move the dial, so if you believe in the forecasts out there, by the end of this decade, there's seven to nine million tons of copper that's needed in order to satisfy this demand, seven to nine million tons of incremental copper, rather. Um, that's seven to nine of the largest mines in the world, seven Escondidas, nine Escondidas in the world that need to come, come in line by 2030. That is an absolute impossibility because mines of that size this day and age take 15, 20 years to yeah. actually develop, right? Yeah. So what's going to happen is you need to see this incremental production that's coming from anybody that has that license to do so. So what is that license generating from, generated from? Well, it's, it's generated from political will, right? So we already know in Canada, we have the political will at the federal level. The federal government uh, announced a $4 billion critical metal strategy uh, in December that actually is carved out of the budget from last year, not this year. $4 billion is going towards critical metal projects mm. uh, in Canada. Uh, critical metals in Canada as defined by five metals, copper being the most critical of that, those metals. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I think there's more to come, obviously, with this upcoming budget at, uh, in the next couple of months. Uh, on the provincial level, uh, we've uh, received nothing but support from the approach that we have progressed. I think Nick had explained this before around our First Nation relationships and agreements and how we view them and their land as it relates to our project. So to make a very long story or you know, agreement short, we recognize that this is their land. This is the uh, something that we would need their ultimate consent. Uh, um, so what we've done is essentially bring that consent piece up front before we even go through a permitting uh, process, um, uh, which I think is a tremendous um, expression of our belief that uh, this is a true partnership between ourselves and First Nations. And for that, we have been um, recognized by the provincial government, uh, specifically by Minister Ralston uh, back in December, for establishing that framework and for essentially leading the way on how British Columbia can be the critical metals epicenter for the future. And then, of course, on the regional level, you know, I think uh, there's a lot of questions around Vancouver Island. We're on the north end of the island. Mm -hmm. It's been industrialized for over 100 years. The, 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 the history of that area has been always mining, fishing, and forestry. In fact, there's actually a day that celebrates that in Port Hardy, uh, which is uh, would be our effectively our hub mm -hmm. uh, camp for the, it's not even a camp, it's a beautiful town uh, for the project. Uh, and, you know, people from all the way from the North Island MLA, who also happens to be the the, the uh, NDP party whip, um, has expressed very public support for our project, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So I think this is a real opportunity for that part of the island, uh, that our province, and then of course our country, to really define and to uphold that intersection between reconciliation and critical metals. Like these are political, uh, very strong political points that have been um you know, uh, progress time and time and time again within our country. And this is a project we believe is a, a partial solution to that, uh, mm -hmm. to that equation. Um, I'll, I'm going to uh, jump over here to, to Robin here in a moment. Um, but uh, before I do, I just, I'm just curious, the, uh, 
what has been the biggest transition from going to into the, from the banking well i mean you're still in finance yep. as the ceo yep. uh, of north isle but yeah. um if you could maybe even a lesson learned or a, a sort of a, a shift that you had to yeah. do um to take on this role sure that's a Another great question, uh, one that I've never been asked and never actually thought about, but because we just completed a cornerstone investment in the company, when I say cornerstone investors, it's three shareholders that all have uh, you know, proven uh, many, many times in the past three, four decades that they've made lots of money for themselves, lots of money for shareholders, and really have a purpose behind their the time that they spend uh, in a project. Um, I think for me, uh, I never realized how critical it was as an investment banker to have that level of influence within a company. Uh, so with investment banking, you rely on institutions, or at least for larger clients, you rely on institutional um, leadership. Uh, but for smaller junior companies, you're always looking for uh, cornerstone fundamental people mm -hmm. that have proven themselves um, in the past to essentially attach themselves to your vision, your mission, your values, right. which is what we found. Um, so for example, our chairman, who's obviously our founding chairman, Dale Corman, he was responsible for uh, purchasing Penasquito uh, for $2 million uh, and then in 2000 and selling it for uh, $1.2 billion in 2006 to Glamis, which is now obviously Newmont's probably one of the more prolific minds today. Donald K. Johnson, who just came in and upped his position to 9.9%. Um, he's a legend in Canada who's probably best known uh, for uh, enabling all of us to be able to donate our shares, charitable giving our shares to charities and uh, obviously getting the tax benefits of doing that. That's raised billions and billions of dollars mm. for people across uh, charities across um, the country uh, and really shows his, his his connection and advocacy, successful advocacy with the government's so understanding all of these regulatory processes that we're going through and appreciating the fact that we're purpose, uh, we've got very strong purpose as to what we're doing today. He also is um, uh, from a investor perspective known for uh, um, uh, starting a company called Go Easy, which was a shell company a few years back, uh, which today is a well over $2 billion company for which wow. he is the founding owner uh, and uh, um, uh, 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 director emeritus, chairman emeritus for that company. So uh, those two are the people that have you know, really uh, spent the last four to five decades proving how successful they, they can be. And then recently we had, um, you know, I would say the prodigious Michael Gentile, um, who who is uh, you know our generation? He's our contemporary. He's mm -hmm. uh, accomplished uh, so much in so so little time. Uh, that's right now he's uh, was the ex portfolio manager for Formula Growth. He now started his fund at Bastion um, uh, Investments, uh, and he's uh, he's made a lot of really successful bets uh, with companies like Arizona Mining K92, uh, which has enabled us to uh, come and look at us. He's a very small um, uh, group of companies that he will invest in, and now he's up to 9.9 percent. So oh. among those three. Three, uh, I would say, very strong, influential people. Uh, our company is underpinned uh, by a 30% cornerstone shareholder base. And whenever we do need money, we raised uh, $2 million to get us uh, to uh, a pro forma level of approximately $8 million, uh, which uh, gives us the ability to advance our project and advance our exploration. Um, it's really nice to have that fundamental group that aren't looking for premium or discounts. They're not looking for half warrants. This was done in at market, no half warrant mm. deal, right? It really shows mm -hmm. the, the their yeah. belief that this is um, uh, an opportunity that already is heavily, heavily discounted. And look, when I say that, I think there's um, there's a lot of people that express this, but I can I can point to numbers. That's what I did when I was an investment banker. We're covered by three analysts. Our analyst consensus NPV. Um, price to NPV is about 4% or 0. 0, 0.04 uh, times of what uh, these analysts are saying. And to give you um, just a broader understanding of where the market is, uh, the range for comparable companies is approximately 0. 0.2 to 0. 0.4 times. So mm. just to get to the bottom end of that range is about 5x from where we are today and to get to the top end of that range is close to 10x. So that's what I think we all understand as cornerstone investors and, and insiders that are advancing this opportunity as well. Uh, Sam, I, I could easily do another 20, 30 minutes, um, but I got to kick you out and bring Robin in. Uh, he's much better looking than I am, so I understand that. <laughs> thank you very much. Great, thank you very much. At OIM Consulting, they drive profitability by building your supervisory capability. They equip the people who carry your culture, engage your teams, and ensure that daily targets are achieved. If you want measurable operational results, visit oimconsulting.com. Analyze, improve, sustain.
Fenner Dunlop Usflex belts are engineered to withstand the harshest applications, delivering benefits that solve customer problems via superior rip, tear, and impact resistance. Usflex are extremely strong and robust belts that are difficult to destroy, which is important for heavy-duty bulk material handling environments. Made in their very own North American manufacturing facilities, this revolutionary concept in straight warp conveyor belting is up to three times more impact resistant versus competitor belting. Usflex users use fewer belts per year, make fewer belt repairs, and replacements, reduce or eliminate belt downtime, and improve employee safety. You can visit FennerDunlopAmericas.com to learn more about their premium Usflex conveyor belting. The CIM 2023 Convention and Expo is coming to Montreal from April 30th to May 3rd. So join us in recognizing your peers at the annual CIM Awards Gala. This year is extra special because CIM is celebrating its 125th anniversary. There will be special programming and perks for exhibitors and attendees alike. Registration is now open and tickets sell out fast. So visit CIM.org to register now for short courses and explore sponsorship opportunities. Robin, welcome to the show. Good to have you on. Thanks, Jared. Look forward to it. Yeah, um, have you got a chance to do a lot of these uh, these long form discussions? This will be my first. Oh, really? Oh, <laughs> well, I'll, I'll try to uh, make it so you want to come back and do more. Okay, <laughs> um, okay we're going to get into the exploration side uh, for North Isle, but before we do it, can we give us a little context of your background? Uh, well, I've graduated as a geologist from Edinburgh University and immediately came over to Canada, immigrated to Canada, and uh, was involved uh, initially with the Uni Mini Air, but went through there to Cypress Anvil is district geologist, and uh, later on, you know, worked in uh, South America with Corriente Resources on Taka Taka Porphyry, looked at other porphyries, and uh, more lately, I was with uh, Entre Gold as exploration manager in Mongolia, and uh, I was also manager of technical operations at Pebble in mm. uh, 2012. So, so you've had a you've had a bit of a career in the mining industry. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, let's, uh, on the North Isle side, um, can you do, sort of give, uh, a little bit of an overview of their exploration strategy, and then maybe we'll highlight a few of, of them? Well, first of all, if you look at the map, we have, uh, 34,000 uh, hectares of claims, 20, 214 claims, and we're about 19 kilometers from Port Hardy, the nearest uh, town, which is, and the, the access is excellent with logging roads all through the property. Yeah. And uh, we uh, we have a, a belt of porphyry centers that extend uh, about 35 kilometers uh, west of uh, Island Copper, which is a mine that was in production from 76 to 96, lastly with BHP. 20 years. Yep. And so the we have uh, two deposits, Hashima and Red Dog, which have uh, resource estimates in a PEA, Preliminary Economic Assessment, which is carried out in 2021, which is on our website, which could be viewed. And uh, we have six other targets. And uh, the two targets I want to discuss t today is Northwest Expo, so most northerly, northwesterly, and Pemberton Hills, both of them quite exciting. So what, uh, I'm not a geologist, and I, I certainly, I, I learned very quickly when doing these episodes, do not pretend that you know something you don't. And I, I just had a guest yesterday, he started asking me questions, I said, no, you don't, that's not what this show is about. Right, right, right. So um, what what makes, uh, I know this is a big question, but just, uh, just to someone like myself, what makes um, the two that you're wanting to highlight, why is there a focus on them today? Is it specific to a certain timeline of where they're at, or results you've gotten? It's uh, basically a, a, a renewed look at them. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about Northwest Expo, first of all. Uh, when I came in, I arrived in North Island July 2021. And uh, there were a number of drill holes that had been drilled, and the program had been set up. And at Northwest Expo, uh, one of the holes was to be drilled to a northerly area. And I said, we should drill to the south. So we turned around, went 250 meters south and drilled what was NW. And, and why at a high level, why? Why? Because the, the in the southern area, pointing to the south, is where they've got cor uh, silica clay pyrite alteration, which is typical of uh, uh, this uh, area for the, where the porphyries are, this alteration. And uh, it's after, uh, it, it's it's associated with the, the, the porphyry system. If, if we jump back to island copper, island copper, the main mineralization was biotite magnetite, emphasized magnetite, and outside that it was chlorite magnetite. Magnetite's important. And then outside you had this sil silica clay pyrite alteration around that. So I said, well, we should drill 
to into the silica clay pyrite alteration. And we did, and that was NW2103. And we got 89 meters of uh, 0.15 copper and uh, almost one gram of gold. So it was about averaging about, uh, I think, 0.86 uh, copper equivalent. And then not in our database, but through the assessment reports, reports found there were six other holes over a distance of uh, 480 meters that also had similar grades. So I put this together in sections and we got 48 meter, 480 meters length and 370 meters down dip with about a 90 meter thickness. And that came up to, my goodness, this could be a potential for 40 to 50 million tons of mineralization uh, and uh, of one gram plus and uh, over uh, 0.15 copper. So plus rhenium uh, with Molly. So, uh, the plan this year is, uh, starting in April, is to drill eight holes and five pads. Luckily, there are good roads there, so they're, they're easy to drill off roads. So we've got these eight holes, and with that, we'll have a, an inferred resource. That will be a starting resource, inferred resource. That's, the, that's our key target uh, at Northwest Expo, to try and see if we can get 40 to 50 million tons. That's the objective. I, I, I can, the interview side of me can't can't avoid this question. The so if there was a, um, a another program that went north, I believe you said, and then you said go south. Is that do I have that right, or do I have it backwards? No, no. The you, they had the, this this target is called Northwest Expo, which yeah. is the very northwesterly of the targets, mm -hmm. and the the. Uh, what what we're drilling yeah. is is that Northwest Expo? Yeah, I j just uh, I'll ask you in a different way. Going back to that, th there was a program that you said let's let's we should be focused on over here as opposed to going this way. You, oh, you oh, earlier. what? Yeah, oh, yeah. the direction? Oh, yeah. the direction of drilling? Yes. It, oh, exactly. okay. So the 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 original uh, direction that was proposed was into what's called propolitic alteration, mm. and that is typically the very outside uh, of a porphyry system. And uh, when I saw that, I looked. I saw that the, there's this silica clay pyrite, which is closer to the core of a porphyry system. Mm. And I said we should be drilling into that, and we did, and we hit the mineralization. Yeah. That. So my question for that was, is that um, I'm not I'm just going to get you to throw another <laughs> geologist under the bus or anything like that, but is it? Um, how these types of projects bring yourself on like because sam was talking about building this team um how important not so much how important it is to have good people that's the obvious but how many of these projects the other projects outside of north isle are are even making an error like that do you think how often is that happening where people are going the wrong direction well i can't answer for other companies but uh, basically uh i i can tell you that i've seen many properties which have been uh, dismissed and they have potential. Mm. I, I, and that, I mean, that's what you constantly see. People, these various properties that people make mines out of, off, a lot of them are have been dismissed. Really? And, and at another view, another an observation, somebody with more experience or different experience, and these the uh, characteristics that are typical. Uh, to them of, of a porphyry or whatever deposit it is, which other 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 geologists uh, haven't recognized. It's like if you take a doctor, if you look at a doctor who's a, a brain surgeon and, and he's trying to do a look at a heart, he's not necessarily understand right. what's going on in and a is heart. And that, is that the difference? Well, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's just experience. And, yeah. and the, the more experience you have uh, of different deposits, the, you can bring that experience to bear on uh, what you see. Like, how quickly did you realize that we needed to go this direction? Uh, almost right away. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. I wanted to, I wish I was a fly <laughs> on the wall in that discussion. Um, so, uh, what about uh, Pemberton Hills? I wanted to touch on that okay, one. So, well. uh, okay, so you, you, you've got our objective for Northwest Expo is to drill and hopefully get uh, 40 to 50 million tons at least. Uh, and the uh, at, at Pemberton, uh, the original idea was well, first of all, in this whole district, uh, uh, I wouldn't say a fluke of nature, just because nature, there are two major uh, faults that are that down drop uh, the, 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 the Bonanza Formation, which is Jurassic and Zedic Volcanics, mm. which you typically see in the Andes and along the coast. And so it down drop that. 
and so what's left that that is preserved the whole porphyry systems of all of these targets including island copper for that matter including the upper what's called lithocap you mm. see these in the miocene younger uh, porphyry systems in south america in the philippines and indonesia and they don't see them often in bc and very few maybe there's maybe one or two because glaciation and erosion over 172 million years is wipe them away. I can't believe that you, I only get to ha have you on the show for 12 minutes. This is, uh, yeah, I, I feel cheated a little bit. Yeah, but so, okay, so, so, so basically what happened is uh, this, there's a lithocap and you, you, it was thought that it was upright like a mushroom. Mm -hmm. And when I came in, one of the first things I recognized that it was probably tilted to the, the southeast. It wasn't upright. And we'd been drilling into the side of the mushroom rather than through the mushroom into the stem, mm. which was the porphyry. And... Uh, Luckily, uh, there were some students at Lakehead University who were under the tutelage or the mentorship of uh, David Cook and Li Jun Zhang out of uh, University of Tasmania Center of Ore Deposits or Sciences Codes, uh, very well known in, in research in lithocaps. And uh, I, I found this out and I, I talked to them and they, uh, I had a Zoom call and I, they said, what do you, uh, before we tell you what we think, uh, what do you think? And I said, well, I, for this, 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 and reason, I said it's dipping to the southwest about 45 degrees. That's what we think. So basically the drilling in the past had been drilling not through the uh, lithocap into the porphyry, been drilling totally into the, uh, the stem mm. or, the, or the, the cap of the mushroom. So right. with that, and they had done uh, work, uh, geochemistry, uh, very detailed uh, analysis of uh, the alterations, look, looking at uh, fertility assessment of the deposits and uh, so on. And this was confidential up until December of this past year. So now we can talk about it. So mm -hmm. they, 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 they had outlined an area about uh, two and a half kilometers by 1.5 kilometers to the northeast of this uh, tilted lithocap. And uh, we had seen it also. And uh, so I said, well, we, we have to do IP. So we did IP at the end of last year. And uh, the, charge of, the chargeability anomalies and the magnetic anomalies are coincident with this quartz sericite pyrite alteration zone. And remember I said, biotite magnetite and chlorite magnetite is common in our de deposits and our, and our targets. So the magnetic response we're hoping is caused by that the magnetic mm -hmm. uh, the biotype magnetite which is contained in the ore mm -hmm. and the the uh, the chargeability anomaly is called caused by the quartz sericite pyrite in fact i put the stake in for the first hole on top of a ridge on a logging wood that had been put in last year and all the rocks i found around it were quartz sericite pyrite so mm -hmm. uh so basically we would hopefully drill through that into mineralization so mm -hmm. That's another, and that's a huge uh, target. I mean, the, the lithocap is 6.5 kilometers long by 1.5 kilometers thick. That is a huge hydrothermal system that created that. So mm. hopefully that bears fruit right. and we have a good deposit there. Well, I think everybody's hoping that. Um, but the, um, I was gonna, just to wrap up the interview um, with your experience in the industry. Um, and so there's sort of two sides of what you said. There's the, the side of the experience you have um, and be able to look at it and just know a different approach. But then you also mentioned going to students that were had studied under two people that I, I don't know the names yeah, of two yeah, people, but, but respected yeah. people in the industry. Yeah, yes. um, so is, is part of your set success that that having the confidence of your own knowledge, but then also being willing to go to a couple students and get there? Well, they, they well, it's it's it it it, it confirms what I thought, everything mm -hmm. that they did, did a lot more detailed work than I was able to do, but just looking at it and basically they confirmed everything that I thought. Right. Is it, uh, do you still, I, I don't know, I enjoy sometimes a little bit of a, a weak word. Do you, do you still get hooked by it when you're trying to look at this? Oh, absolutely. This I mean, absolutely. There's two other areas that uh, I did mention was one is good speed and downward dog. Downward dog we just recently found, uh, well, refound. It was, it's just north of red dog. And we have a, a copper, gold, and molybdenum anomaly, which is classic in a porphyry, surrounded by a, a zinc anomaly peripheral to that. And I quickly got some IP over that, and their charge of William anomalies was associated with that. And just east of uh, Good uh, Red Dog uh, is Goodspeed, and they're uh, for one of the first things I did. My fourth sample I took, my first trip up there 
there is an outcrop. Uh, if you're looking at, uh, this is experience, you, you look at the, the outcrops and they're yellow, orange, which is weathering of pyrite. This was a red, uh, reddish orange outcrop. And I immediately stopped the truck, said, stop the truck. Different from everything else. And, mm. and from my background looking elsewhere, often, not always, but often that red color is associated with hematite, which is a weathering product of chalcopyrite. So the first rock I cracked had malachite, which is copper carbonate, and there's chalcopyrite and boronite in it. So that area had actually been drilled before, and uh, we've looked at it, and uh, there could be, uh, the, 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 we've, added, we've looked at all the geophysics associated with that. We've potentially, that's a much bigger area mm. than was originally drilled and there were some good results i mean and, and there are four good holes yeah in the uh, yeah it's it's very exciting having having you and sam on um it's uh again we, we both i think did shorter we probably need to get you in our studio at one point and get the two of you talking yeah. um for the like yeah. that full hour but uh it's it's been an absolute pleasure no, i could talk i could talk for hours because i find it very exciting <laughs> yeah i can tell i can tell no i'm having to hold myself back because of time constraints but but thank you very much for coming thank on you. the show appreciate thank it you, sir. okay Okay, that's our episode. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Uh, we'll have plenty of information, um, links to North Isle, um, ways you can get in touch with them, follow them on LinkedIn, everything like that. Uh, please keep watching the episodes, share them out. Uh, we, we love bringing these to you. And always, please feel free to suggest more guests. We're always trying to find the, the latest and greatest in, in mining, but also people that have been around a long time and have a lot of experience. We just kind of need it all on mining now. So thank you, everybody. We will see you on the next episode of mining now.